For millennia, people have spotted mysterious objects in the sky. Most witnesses are ordinary, sensible people, startled at what they see. Many now report their encounters to government officials who deny any knowledge of UFOs. Conspiracy? Cover-up? Or an ominous miscalculation of the power of the unexplained? Nineteen eighty, one hundred forty miles outside London on the east coast of England, Woodbridge and Brentwater's naval bases under the command of the United States Air Force. Together, they formed the largest tactical fighter wing in the world. The two bases were separated by a three-mile stretch of heavy woods known as Rendlesham Forest. The backdrop for one of the most investigated UFO sightings in history. This is what it looked like just after midnight on December 27th. Woodbridge security supervisor, Sergeant Jim Penniston, rushed to the East Gate, where sentries alerted him to strange lights. My first uh, thought on it was uh, it was an aircraft downing, a possible aircraft crash. There was a color scheme of red and yellow and some white light. That's the reaction they get with chemicals. Penniston radioed back to the flight supervisor and was given permission to investigate. He and the sentries advanced into the darkness until they stumbled on a sight they could not explain. The uh, air, for example, had a, a feeling of electricity in it. My feelings at the time ran from confusion to uh, disbelief. I could not understand for the life of me uh, what this could be. The craft itself measured approximately nine feet by nine feet, triangular in shape. It had no cockpit, as far as I could tell. There was no windows. Just this uh, very highly uh, shiny, black, glass-like material. And I think the most fascinating part of it, at least as far as I was concerned as an investigator, was the fact that this had identifiable inscription uh, symbols on the side of it. Penniston says he approached the craft. It was warm when he touched it. Suddenly, it began to move, lifting up silently right before his eyes and disappearing into the night sky. Penniston claims he drew this sketch of the craft at a debriefing the next morning with the deputy base commander, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt. The next night, Halt received word that the strange lights had returned. Well, the base commander and I looked at each other quite in disbelief. And I said, well, we both agree we needed to put this to bed. Eager to debunk the entire affair, Holt collected a Geiger counter, night vision star scope, and a handheld tape recorder. Then, with a few men from the disaster preparedness unit, he drove to the area where Penniston had seen the UFO. Soon, the portable lights they had brought mysteriously flickered and died. Holt, concerned for the safety of his men, ordered several of them back to the East Gate. With the rest of his unit, he walked into the forest checking radiation levels. He says they seemed unusually high. Suddenly, off in the distance, Halt spotted a glowing object. This is the actual recording Halt made of his UFO encounter that night. And there we stood. Well, we didn't know quite what to think of that. But when we looked to the north, suddenly there were objects in the sky. And we watched this in awe. Suddenly the object came toward us at high speed. It moved directly toward us. I can't estimate the speed, but it moved very rapidly. Stop and send down a pencil-like beam at our feet. And just as fast as the beam appeared, it just clicked off, disappeared. I still have questions as to what happened. I really don't know what it was. I do know it was something strange, something that was controlled by some type of intelligence. And that's about all I really know. Two weeks later, Halt described the incident in a one-page memo sent to the British Ministry of Defense. The British government never responded to the memo, but word of the encounter spread. Three years later, UFO researchers pressured the Air Force commander to release the document under the Freedom of Information Act. Well, he released it. And the very next day, I got to meet BBC One, BBC Two, ITV, German TV, 
Japanese TV, every local radio station. Um, they were waiting on my doorstep at home and at the office. It was just unbelievable. News of the Rendlesham incident also generated enormous interest from UFO researchers and skeptics. Here was a case with highly credible witnesses, trained Air Force personnel. Tucson astronomer and retired U.S. Air Force pilot James McGehey is a UFO skeptic who investigated Halt and Penniston's alleged encounter. McGehey insists Halt mistook the beams from a lighthouse five miles away for a spacecraft. That object that was winking at him, which is on the tape, is clearly the lighthouse. Now he's looking at the lighthouse, I think, with a starlight scope. Now remember, here comes this beam of light. He's looking at this light with 100,000 times intensity. What it's going to do is it's going to burn out the image in the center, so it's going to become black. And that's what easily explains the beams and these other things. When Halt's tape is played against the flashing from the lighthouse, this seems to be the case. I can't explain that. I really don't know. I never gave it any thought. I do know that the whole time we were out there, we could see the lighthouse. And the lighthouse was about 35 or 40 degrees off to our right from where this whole thing took place. Did area radar operators confirm the UFO sighting? Halt says maybe. They really didn't confirm they found anything. Although later I found out that when they reviewed the tapes, they did find some things on the tape. If he has a radar report, I'd like to see it because I investigated this and I couldn't find one. Skeptics also suggest the Rendlesham UFO might have been a meteor, bright stars, or a Russian satellite that fell out of the sky that night. Uh, to me, this is just a case of where a number of people saw some lights, uh, got a little excited, thought about UFOs, and all of a sudden everything they see is a UFO. The first night, it was a combination of a satellite re-entry, a meteor fireball, and a police car driving around in the woods. The second night, it turns out to be a lighthouse, some microwave antennas, and some stars in the sky. We had a controlled landing. Apparently, there was no crater. We also had a craft that was able to take back off with absolutely no sound, which tells me high technology, and maneuver back through the tree line, rise over the trees, hover mo momentarily, and then take off at incredible speed. It's just uh, totally ridiculous to even consider uh, that it was a Russian satellite or a meteor. Impossible. In 1991, believing serious questions were still unanswered, the British government finally responded to the Rendlesham incident. Nick Pope, its top UFO investigator, reopened the case. I've always felt that Rendlesham Forest is a case which uh, displays a lot of important factors all drawn together. You have a multiple witness event. Those witnesses are trained military observers. The Defence Radiological Protection Service had no explanation as to why the radiation readings taken by Colonel Holt's team were so high. Undoubtedly, something very strange had happened there. Pope requested further investigation. The British government said no and closed the file. Perhaps in part due to this fact, Sergeant Penniston arrived at the site at approximately 1 a.m. and re-emerged from Rendlesham Forest after dawn, but can only account for less than an hour of his time. Skeptics question how Penniston could make such an historic discovery and yet not report back to the base for several hours. What we had thought was apparently only uh... Uh, maybe an hour's worth of investigation time turned out to be four hours. Um, I got a feeling that might have been the adrenaline. Uh, that we were pumped up at that point in time. What is it that Penniston says he saw and touched that night? To this day, he is perplexed by the entire incident. Something that can sustain a control flight, something that has mass, something that uh, makes no sound, and something that uh, can take off at incredible speeds back up into the atmosphere. Explain it. I can't. Unknown forms in the sky surprise and alarm citizens below, sometimes causing governments to do battle with the unexplained.
Belgium, the center of Europe, and the focus of one of the most famous UFO encounters in history. On the evening of November 15, 1989, police officer Francis Michelsik had completed a few hours of routine patrol in Anza Belgian village near the German border. When Michelsik says he looked up and became one of the first witnesses of the Belgian wave. Nous avons observé une masse importante qui était dans le ciel. We saw a large mass in the sky, a triangular mass with three lights oriented downward, about 200 meters from our police van. Cet objet ne faisait pas de bruit et il était immobile. The object was silent and immobile. This object did not correspond in any way to anything we'd seen before. À ce que nous avions déjà pu voir dans le passé. Two weeks later, Dita Plumens, a member of the Gendarmerie, the Belgian National Police Force, heard over his police radio fellow officers nearby reporting a strange object in the night sky. At first, when we heard our colleagues talking to dispatching, we thought they were crazy. Plumens requested permission to investigate, and when he reached the edge of town, he says he witnessed an astounding sight. We stopped right in front of the nursing home, and there was an immense object over our heads. The object had three lights at its extremities and a blinking red light in the center. At a certain point, I saw a small object leave the large thing, an object which was also flashing, which came straight down and then turned and flew around the back of the nursing home. After that, the large object transformed itself into a single light and we followed it toward Germany. Belgian radio and TV soon were filled with reports of similar sightings, prompting hundreds of calls to the office of the top UFO research group in Belgium, known by its acronym SOBEPS. Over the next several months, researchers documented more than 800 so-called close encounters. SOBEPS eventually published two thick volumes on the Belgian wave. Specific characteristics of the phenomenon uh, were reported by many, many, many people. Uh, we have hundreds of reports of people who mentioned something below a distance of uh, 100 meters. Then, on March 30th, 1990, the Belgian wave story took a dramatic twist. Near midnight, several police officers called a NATO radar installation with reports of a UFO. Within an hour, that facility and a second radar station were both tracking an unknown flying object. Okay, the chief of operations for the Belgian Air Force, Lieutenant Colonel Wilfred de Brouwer, ordered ground command to scramble a pair of F-16 fighter jets armed with missiles. A supersonic high-tech cat and mouse game ensued. The jets' radar locked on to their targets nine times. But with each lock on, the object drastically changed its position. After an hour, the F-16s lost contact and returned to base. For weeks, the encounter was kept under wraps, but Colonel de Brouwer felt compelled to share what he knew. During an interview with a reporter from one of Europe's most popular magazines, Paris Match, de Brouwer described what happened. The story stopped the presses. Within days, de Brouwer called a news conference and told reporters from around the world what he knew and what he didn't know. This is what the pilots saw on their radar. The UFO appears as a diamond in the center of the screen. What these pilots um, uh, detected was well outside the normal flying envelope of an airplane. In other words, uh, sometimes they had what we call lock-ons on a target uh, which gave a parameters varying from speeds uh, between 150 knots till uh, 990 knots. 
uh, an acceleration which occurred in a few seconds. The speeds would be impossible to, to tolerate uh, for a human being. Colonel de Brouwer never suggested the mysterious flying craft was from outer space. He only said its speed and rate of acceleration were unexplained. Over the next few months, the sightings became more sporadic, and the Belgian wave came to an end. Did the skies over Belgium become a way station for alien spacecraft? If not, what did thousands of people witness? Physical evidence is the key to proving the existence of UFOs. The Belgian wave, despite hundreds of credible eyewitnesses, has produced only one piece of convincing evidence. This photo, taken by a civilian bystander in the town of Petit Rechon. The photo was examined by former NASA scientist Richard Haynes, a specialist in vision, optics, and human perception. My analysis of the Petit Rechon photograph suggests very strongly to me that the object that was photographed uh, does not obey laws of physics as we know them. The second point I would make is it's not a forgery. And finally, I think that there may be some clues in this photograph having to do with propulsion and lift. Belgian scientists and skeptics tried to calm what they considered the UFO hysteria of the Belgian wave. A professor at the Astrophysics Institute at Belgium's prestigious University of Liège, Pierre Mega, decided to put the Petit Rechamps photo to his test. We tried to reproduce this photograph and uh, we, we produced this, this picture, which is, uh, well, very close to the original picture. So I think the only way to go ahead and to try to understand more is to, is to do as we did, to analyze the witness report together with, with the photograph and to see if, if everything is consistent. And there are so many inconsistencies that, that it's very hard to believe it's, it's a true. Well, it's a true picture. I don't see how someone could recreate this down at the almost the grain level of the film. Uh, it would take a Steven Spielberg kind of a capability to do this in a, in a technical laboratory. The most convincing evidence for the skeptics' position involved the radar lock-ons by the F-16s. Belgium's Electronic War Center analyzed the radar tapes and found that the object descended below ground level at some points a physical impossibility. The center concluded that all but one of the radar lock-ons were really caused by electromagnetic interference or unusual atmospheric conditions. Eventually, even Sobeps agreed, but one major question remains unanswered and unexplained. Experts say that when ground-based and air-based radar track the same object simultaneously, the object is real. One of the lock-ons, a simultaneous tracking of the UFO by one of the F-16s and the ground radar station, has never been explained. If I remember, it's lock-on number nine, uh, which has some very weird characteristics. And these characteristics doesn't fit with atmospherical explanation, not at all. Thousands of people still wonder if what they saw came from another world. Others ask if that single perplexing radar report is a clue to civilizations in distant galaxies. Questions for those who find answers in the unexplained. For years, the U.S. government seriously investigated sightings of UFOs. Thousands of cases passed through the hands of military and other government agencies. Most of these cases had rational explanations. The rest remain classified as unexplained. Fifty-year-old Polish immigrant and amateur geologist Stephen Mahalik looked forward to his weekend getaways alone in the Falcon Lake area, 90 miles east of his home in Winnipeg, Manitoba. This was Mahalik's favorite prospecting site. Around noon on May 20th, 1967, as he examined a quartz formation, Mahalik was distracted by some unruly geese. He looked up and was transfixed. He says he saw two cigar-shaped objects glowing red in the sky. The following is a recording Mahalik later made 
of what he saw next. The size, you know, was amazing. And here they coming down. With speed, I just can't describe it. Amazing speed. Mahalik says one of them stopped, suddenly accelerated, then disappeared. The other landed about 50 yards away. He watched in awe. I hear shh, and I hear a high pitch whistle of running equipment, pumps on high speed. When the tank landed, it was of gray pink color. It's stainless steel, and it was pink hot. And I can feel the breeze on my face that that thing is hot outside. There was my notebook. There was my pencil. So I sketched this. Mahalik claims it was round, about 40 feet long and about 10 feet high. His curiosity took hold, and he approached the craft. He examined the outside of it, slowly touching the glowing skin with his gloved hand. It was fiery hot, nearly melting the palm of his rubber glove. Mahalik says the craft rotated, turning its grid-like exhaust vent toward him. Seven. The blast of hot gas from the vent knocked him to the ground, setting his shirt and undershirt on fire. The craft suddenly lifted off the ground, according to Mahalik, and soared straight up. He threw his burning shirts to the ground, dazed and in severe pain from burns to his chest and stomach. Mahalik says he wandered around for what seemed like hours before he managed to gather up his supplies. He found his way out of the woods, caught a bus, and later that night arrived back in Winnipeg. Still in pain, he rushed from the bus station to nearby Misericordia Hospital, where he was treated for first-degree burns. Mahalik claimed the blast from the craft had etched a grid-like pattern into his abdomen that matched the pattern on the exhaust vent. The next day, Sunday, he was spirited off to the St. Regis Hotel after convincing the managing editor of Winnipeg's highly regarded daily newspaper, the Winnipeg Tribune, that his extraordinary encounter was real. At that time, I said, OK, as any newsman would have done, draw it. I gave him a piece of paper. I think that drawing has become the most famous UFO piece of evidence in the world today. He sat down, he drew it in front of me. I hit it. I talked to him. I called doctors, I called police, and I sure as hell didn't want the Winnipeg Free Press getting the story. Monday's edition of the Tribune led with this headline. Mahalik soon became a sensation worldwide. What followed was one of the most intensely examined UFO cases on record. Over the next two years, Mahalik's burns kept recurring, and no one could explain why. He was examined by more than a dozen physicians in Canada and the United States, including doctors at the Mayo Clinic. An investigation by the Royal Canadian Air Force concluded that the abdominal burns sustained by Mr. Mahalik remain as unexplainable as to the source of the burn. The Mayo Clinic psychological report concluded that Mahalik was not prone to delusions, hallucinations, or any type of emotional disorder. Perhaps the most influential investigation was conducted under the auspices of the United States government. The chief investigator, physicist Roy Craig, is now retired and raises llamas on his Colorado ranch. His job was to examine UFO reports and find physical evidence. We responded to the Falcon Lake report as soon as we could. Now, there's no value in, in seeing a landing site that somebody's had a chance to go back and prepare for me to look at. But if we could get back and find a landing site that had not been seen by anyone else or been altered by human beings, there may be something there that we could use as real evidence that he had a real experience. I mean, comparable with the appearance of human beings on Earth. Two weeks after the encounter, Craig flew to Winnipeg and joined Mahalik on his first return to the landing site. He guided us on what he said was a big search for the site. Actually, we just roamed around in, in uh, haphazard circles, uh, coming back to about where we started and didn't go very far at all. 
He was trying to give us the impression of leading us on a search for a site. And we all concluded that the site probably did not exist. With no apparent physical evidence, Craig classified the case as without merit. The American investigation was over. University of Manitoba astronomer Chris Rutkowski, believing the government reports left many questions unanswered, launched his own investigation. In 1994, he published The Falcon Lake Case, Too Close an Encounter, in the respected Journal of UFO Studies. The terrain around uh, the site is very rugged, uh, very rocky. Uh, the brush is very, very dense. The trees all look alike. The rocks all look alike. And to a person who's disoriented, uh, not feeling very well, it might be very, very difficult to find the exact site after some period of time has elapsed. Skeptics disagreeing with Rutkowski also do not believe that Mahalik would make physical contact with an extremely hot object he assumed was a UFO. But this does not surprise his son. He is the kind of fellow that fear is not in his vocabulary. Not that he's a fearless man, but that when he sees something he doesn't understand, he doesn't fear it. He just chooses to understand it. Skeptics wonder why no one else saw the craft. I talked with the people who were in charge of managing the fire tower. It was manned at that time. And the people were absolutely certain that there was no way that two vehicles, like he described, glowing as they were, could fly into that space and out again. There was no way that that could happen without their seeing it. My conclusion on that case is that all the evidence that I found pointed toward hoax rather than a real experience. And not even uh, a skillful hoax, a, a very inept hoax. Mahalik became bedridden and incapacitated in the 1980s. Was this hardworking and devoted family man capable of crafting such a hoax? For my dad to fabricate something as large as this would require more than I think he had. Uh, more than he has. He's a simple man. He grew up and lived a very straight, hard life. This was no con man. This was a man who later went down a mail. They couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. The doctor I had there couldn't figure it out. I am not about to be taken by anybody. This guy didn't take me. This guy was legit. Stephen Mahalik never wavered from his story. He believed he had encountered a UFO. Roy Craig and the U.S. government disagreed, but they never classified the case as solved. The official report lists Mahalik's sighting as unexplained. In the past, the U.S. government routinely took a keen interest in reports of UFOs. Now, it denies any investigative role leaving only questions for witnesses of close encounters with the unexplained. On the night of March 8, 1994, something strange was sighted in the skies over Holland, Michigan, on the southeastern shore of Lake Michigan. Witnesses were startled and called police. There were uh, at least four lights, and they were all flashing like, like okay, there were the sequence, it was a kind of like a V. There were like probably four or five lights, and they were all flashing right in a row from the top all the way down to the bottom. The lights hovered over the outskirts of town near the home of Holly and Daryl Graves. Their 15-year-old son, Joey, was sitting in the living room watching TV. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a light, and I looked out the window, and there was a, a round circle of light. I called my parents and, and uh, they, they were sleeping. They didn't, they didn't know what was going on. And my mom, she called 911 to get a cop or someone out here to look at it. 911. Um, we were just wondering, have you heard anything about these lights that are flickering up here? It's different. I've never seen anything like it. Okay, well, have somebody check it out. It, well, it, it looked like a sphere. The, the lights were really weird because they changed, but they kind of faded into a different color, so it wasn't like regular lights. So it was kind of weird. We watched it up to about a half hour, just slowly moving south. We were just in awe, I think, about the whole thing. 
there was no noise. It was very peaceful out. We just stood there and watched this object. At that moment, Officer Veldhaus pulled in the driveway. Well, what I saw were uh, two bright lights. Uh, their movement was uh, something that really caught my attention. Their speed uh, accelerated and then it slowed down again. And I decided to have our 911 dispatcher contact a, uh, a radar operator in Muskegon, Michigan. It was a clear night, it was about 10 p.m. I was alone on duty and uh, we had a call from the uh, central dispatcher in Ottawa County, which is quite common uh, for the uh, police department to call us whenever they have uh, any type of weather questions. Weather service, Muskegon. Hi, Muskegon. This is Ottawa County 911 calling. You getting anything weird down in the southern Ottawa County area? Bouchon checked his radar for any images, what radar operators call returns. I'm seeing three of those. They're very strong. These are huge returns. I've never seen anything like this. Not even when I'm doing storms. This is really weird. These are bigger than planes. They're about over the center of uh, Lake Michigan, three of them in a triangle. What was extraordinary about this case was that radar apparently detected the object at the same time witnesses saw it. It is a level of confirmation rarely achieved in reported UFO sightings. Airplanes look like they're moving. Uh, these were just sitting still. And then uh, um, a few minutes later, they would disappear from one spot and show up somewhere else. I really didn't know what it was. Strange lights in the night sky moving at otherworldly speed. The image confirmed on a radar screen. Was this finally convincing evidence of a technology far beyond our own? Had alien spacecraft paid a visit to Holland, Michigan? There was no explanation for these sightings. A reporter for the Muskegon Chronicle, Michael Walsh, decided to investigate for himself. He too found the story remarkable. We've had past articles where people have reported some strange phenomena, especially at this time of year. Um, but not once did we ever have any dual confirmations, uh, visual plus the, the radar. Talk about a meeting. Okay. Others began looking into the incident, fascinated by the radar confirmation. A professor of natural sciences and, at the same time, the editor of the Journal of UFO Studies, UFO researcher Michael Swords, met with radar operator Jack Bouchon. We went into the uh, radar room. Uh, this young fellow really knew how to use the equipment. He would, he would show us the difference between a hard count of something like an airliner and a soft response of something like a storm cloud. And it was obvious this was an extremely competent operator. Skeptics point out that Bouchon was still a weather service intern at the time of the sighting. California engineer and skeptic Robert Schaefer thinks he can explain what the images really were. The National Weather Service says that they tracked the number of objects over Lake Michigan, but of course not everything that turns up on radar is a solid object. Uh, radar is subjected to mirage conditions of various kinds. Schaefer believes that the sightings over the lake can be explained by a natural phenomenon, which usually happens over Lake Michigan in the spring. Warm air moves over the cold waters of the lake. The layer of cold air trapped beneath the layer of warm air creates a mirror effect in the sky by bending the light. This effect is called a temperature inversion. One of the best known investigators of UFO sightings, Philip J. Class, is a technical journalist for Aviation Week in space technology and an expert on radar systems. Ground radar, especially during temperature inversion conditions, the rays can be, instead of going straight out, they can be bent downwards, so where you get echoes from the ground. We're trained to uh, uh, know the difference between temperature inversions and, for instance, uh, precipitation, because uh, they appear to be the same thing. Class says that since Bouchon was using old linear radar, not the newer Doppler radar, the images were probably atmospheric tricks. It is a weather radar. It is not designed, especially, to detect metal objects or aircraft. These 
returns were not only hard returns, but they showed up in this geometric pattern. And that when, say, the lead return would move out into Lake Michigan, the other two would stay behind. Then they would move to reform the triangle. In fact, according to Muskegon Chronicle reporter Michael Walsh, most of the UFO witnesses did report strikingly similar patterns, shapes, and sizes. I believe that each of them sincerely believed what they saw was something extraordinary. That's not to say that it's extraterrestrial or paranormal. It may very well be a, a very physical manifestation of something that we don't yet know about. There is no consensus on what the UFOs over Holland, Michigan might have been. Skeptics point to a temperature inversion and its effect on both the lights in the sky and the radar on the ground. Witnesses, including a weather service radar operator, say they know they saw something real. But what was it? I have no idea. Personally, I'm not sure what I saw either. Well, it was a UFO. I was like in awe. Do these eyewitness accounts and the radar confirmation merit further investigation? The government answered that question long ago. It says no, leaving this encounter one that may forever remain unexplained. Since the 1940s, believers in the unexplained have charged the U.S. government with conspiracy and cover-up. In the 1990s, those charges concentrated on a super-secret military base. In the heart of the desert, on the outskirts of Las Vegas, sits Nellis Air Force Base. 85 miles to the northwest is restricted Area 4808E, popularly known as Area 51, a jumble of mysterious hangars and runways in one of the most desolate places on Earth. Officially, it does not exist. Here, the U.S. tests its most exotic and advanced flying machines. The B-2 stealth bomber, the Blackbird, and the U-2. The Area 51 control tower identifies itself to area pilots only as Dreamland. There are no tours of Area 51. Instead, soldiers carry loaded machine guns with the authorization to use them. This base, shrouded in secrecy, has become for many the focus of the world's fascination with UFOs and its hope for contact with extraterrestrial life. UFO fans from all over the world drive the extraterrestrial highway, a lonely stretch of road that hugs the perimeter of the base to Mailbox Road. From this location, hundreds of UFO sightings have been reported. The vast majority have been explained as lights from the latest earthbound military technology. Some, however, are harder to identify. Author Chuck Clark describes a remarkable craft he says he has seen many times. It can go from a hover to several thousand miles an hour and back to a hover instantly. Uh, it can make very sharp right angle turns and sharper than right angle turns. I've seen 120 degree turns at high speed. It appears and disappears in midair, things that normal aircraft don't do. UFO buffs contend the U.S. is testing an extraterrestrial craft at Area 51. But skeptics and UFO researchers agree that Area 51 is a UFO bust. Almost all the sightings I hear about happen at night. And at night, you can't judge distance. You can't judge easily height in the sky. You can't judge speed. You can't judge actual performance. What I think is that um, there are no UFOs there. There are no UFOs being developed there. There's no UFO technology there. Today, the government does not investigate UFO sightings, but for years, they were of vital interest. Beginning in 1948, the US Air Force began what became known as Project Blue Book, the government's official UFO investigating arm. But both skeptics and UFO believers say Project Blue Book was half-hearted at best. As time went on, and especially after the year of 1952, 
Blue Book's mission was changed. It was changed from being a somewhat serious look at unidentified flying objects to be basically a public relations office to try to diffuse emotionalism that was occurring in the American public about this. So because this was a rather unsatisfying task to the people at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, they tried rather continuously from the mid-50s onward to get rid of this task. In 1966, the U.S. Air Force commissioned the University of Colorado to conduct a thorough evaluation of the UFO phenomenon. The Condon Commission, named after its chairman, Dr. Edward Condon, began an 18-month investigation that ended in controversy. Condon uh, was an eminent physicist who um, ridiculed UFOs. He didn't take it seriously. He didn't spend time on the project. So the project went wrong because essentially from the top, not the scientific staff, but from the top, it was designed to help the Air Force get rid of the UFO problem. Well, how could it be designed to do that unless it said UFOs weren't important, weren't serious, and weren't a scientific problem? Retired physicist and former investigator for the Condon Commission, Roy Craig, strongly supports the Commission's work. We'd have some excellent reports come in with all sorts of proof that there was a strange vehicle there. And each bit of evidence that we checked out uh, turned out to not be what it really sounded like to start with. And the evidence just plain got less and less. The more we learned about the case, the, the less uh, mysterious it became. The commission considered whether UFOs were a threat to America's airspace, demanding military investigation. There was no threats to our security, therefore they really didn't have to uh, interject themselves in the investigation. They could leave this over to civilian agencies. We don't have any national security defense against this anyway. And if these characters wanted to do something really overtly and catastrophically nefarious to us, this would probably have gone on a long time ago. The Condon Commission concluded that the government should stop investigating UFOs. As a result, in 1969, after 21 years and 15,000 UFO reports, including thousands classified as unexplained, the Air Force closed down Project Blue Book. But interest in UFOs remains high, despite the official position taken by the government. Was the government justified in terminating its UFO investigations? Most scientists and researchers, including astronomer Larry Chupik of Chicago's Adler Planetarium, say yes. We don't find that the stories of aliens in some government hangar are true. We don't find pieces of spacecraft. I think when people look at the sky and they don't know what they're seeing, they tend to think of unusual things. And they've heard reports. So reports can stimulate them to make their mind see something they're not really seeing. I don't reject the idea that there are flying saucers on Earth from elsewhere on the basis that has always been given that our universe is so vast that they couldn't get here and therefore they aren't here. We could not, because of our ignorance of our universe, say that other, other beings could not be here. I think it's arrogance to make that kind of statement on the basis of our current scientific knowledge. But that doesn't mean that I think they are here. I don't believe we've been visited by extraterrestrials. I haven't seen the evidence for it yet. So we say the question is very much open and, and should be studied carefully. For 30 years, I've been looking. I have yet to find a single piece of scientifically credible evidence to indicate that we have alien visitors. All we have are unexplained cases. Have we been visited by extraterrestrials? Could the elusive evidence be found in a small number of mysterious reports that defy explanation? Almost all of them turn out to be things we as scientists can identify, even though most people couldn't. Now, those last few are always questionable because neither we nor the observers know what they are. These are the unexplained. People will always stare at the sky and wonder about its mysterious images. They then will turn to their leaders for answers. The leaders turn to science. In the end, people have a choice. 
accept the answers of science, or embrace what lies in the vast reaches of the unexplained.